Production support for the weekly special is provided by IU School of Public Health Bloomington, addressing public health needs by preventing disease, promoting health, and improving quality of life across the state and around the world through research, teaching, and community engagement. Smithville Fiber, the Giga City Company, a philanthropic community partner since 1922, and a proud supporter of numerous community organizations. More information at smithville.com. The Alcobine Recognition Endowment Fund, established by friends and family of Alcobine to support jazz initiatives on WTIU and WFIU. And WTIU members, thank you. Powerful words can inspire reflection and change. Learn how Hoosiers both past and present use expression to impact their communities. Meet an incredible Indiana writer transforming her city with slam poetry. Discover the lore of Limberloss through the eyes of famed author Gene Stratton Porter. And wander the Limberloss woods in our latest natural wonders. Plus, welcome the musically diverse sounds of Audiodacity to the studio. See how language can change your world. It's all coming up right now on the weekly special. Welcome to the weekly special. I'm Daryl Muir. And I'm Erica Sagone. As I'm sure we've all experienced, words can have the power to illuminate and inspire. Create communities and change communities. While Sierra Miller received her MFA and MA in Poetry and African American Studies at Indiana University, she founded the Bloomington, Indiana Poetry Slam Series, using her spoken words to raise awareness and encourage understanding in divisive times. A gang of college frat boys walked into CVS, loud and laughing the term Chirac. I turned around like the black man in Franz Fanon's black skin, white mask, when the little French child said, look, a Negro. Because in naming, one should always expect an answer. In Bloomington, Indiana, a name like Chirac is for the shadows of Chicago's west and south side where news stories about bullet wounds can only be compared to a third world country. The four frat boys continue to laugh as I remain stuck in an aisle, confused about the meaning of natural and artificial flavors. Chirac, I laughed, and then laughed again to myself at the memory of my saxophonist friend complaining about journalists who refer to his sound as Coltrane-ish. The two sound nothing alike, besides maybe an instrument. So I turned to the laughing frat boys and asked, do you pronounce it Chirac or Chirac? As in, who is the president of Iraq or Iraq? As in, who came to occupy Inglewood or North Londale? As in, do you even know about Inglewood or North Londale? As in, when you merge the names of a city and a nation, do you know anything about either place? The boys look stunned, one step forward with a hands up, don't shoot pose, I fired anyway. What does five gunshots look like to a girl who comes home before the street lights glare? Could it sound like home? What do Iraqi children dream about besides war or religion? Wasn't I the child stuffed in windowless classrooms built like prisons? Wasn't I the child given books with torn front and back covers, restrooms with ripped down doors where us girls had to pee in front of each other? quelling the awkwardness with reminders that it's okay, we all have the same thing. Tell me about mothers who raise their children amongst bullets. Tell me about mothers who kiss their sons, who carry guns and bullet wounds in their chest. Tell me about black on black crime. Tell me about human beings being murdered. It was just a joke, one of the gentle boys said. I mean, you know, Chicago can be a scary place. I told him, them that yes, I do know. And that until they've actually held the names of boys and girls on their tongues for longer than a five second sigh at the number of deaths rendered invisible in this American landscape, don't talk to me about war, about bodies falling, about this black body here. What is it you have to say to the woman whose name you speak? Chirac, I am here 
as alive as a ghost rebirthed in Bloomington, Indiana. And when you call someone's name, always expect an answer. Sierra currently lives in Chicago, where she has started an incredible test prep and career support company in her community. Learn more at the Miller's Learning Center Facebook page. Poetry Slam series are happening across the state. Their mission is to promote the creation and performance of poetry that encourages voices to be heard beyond social or cultural barriers. Learn more at PoetrySlam.com. Erica, I really respect that powerful and poignant social commentary. Yeah, and Sierra has undoubtedly encouraged others to find their voice as well. Well, using expression to expand the minds of those around you isn't new. In fact, for one of Indiana's most famous authors, her words not only created new worlds, but saved existing ones. In the heart of Adams County lies Limberlost Swamp, a 13,000 acre wetland that serves as a home for migrating birds and diverse plant life. The wetlands were also frequented by hunters and travelers from around the area, whose experiences led to the birth of many myths and legends. There were two, possibly three, limber gyms. The first one took place in the 18 teens. Uh, a man named Limber Jim Corbus got lost along the creek south of here, and when he found his way out a, few, a little bit later. Everyone talked about how Limber got lost on the creek. So when the government surveyor came and asked what everything was called in this area, when he pointed to the creek on the map and said, what do you call this? Limber Jim said, that's the creek I got lost at. Call it after me. So the surveyor wrote down, and this is in the records, Limber Lost Creek. In the early 1890s, Jean Stratton Porter moved to Geneva, Indiana with her husband and daughter. They built their family cabin on the swamp, and she began to venture further into the wetlands, finding solace in the trees, the skies, and nature. Nature can be trusted to work her own miracle in the heart of any man whose daily task keeps him alone among her sights, sounds, and silences. She was not writing at that time, at least not professionally. She might have been writing on her own, but she didn't uh, start writing until a few years after they moved into this house, which was 1895. That's when the construction was completed. And she started writing articles from outdoor magazines, and that was 1900. Her sole purpose through everything she did just about was to bring nature to people so they would understand it and appreciate it and love it. When Freckles and Elnora, the girl of the Limberlost, her two most famous characters, were out there, Jean would be describing uh, the flowers they saw, the animals they saw, the things they were doing, talk about the seasons, the cycles, how things interacted with each other. So she was truly uh, educating people while they were enjoying the reading. I write as the birds sing, because I must, and usually from the same source of inspiration. Inspired by the plants and animals living there, Jean Stratton Porter began to write stories telling the history of the local wetlands, describing the beauty of its landscape and rallying conservation efforts. Her most famous novel, A Girl of the Limberlost, put both Porter and her beloved swamp on an international stage. She was definitely a conservationist the time she lived here. The first article she wrote for an outdoor magazine was uh, taking a stand against women using bird feathers in their hats because the slaughter of the birds was tremendous. She wrote uh, other conservation articles and one of her most famous conservation quotes was put into her nature book, Music of the Wild, that she wrote while she lived here. But even as the beauty of the swamp reached readers and visitors alike, growing industry began taking its toll on the vegetation and animal life. Before long, the swamp began to deteriorate. The wetlands were dredged and drained, and the water slowly receded. But Jean Stratton Porter still wrote, still ventured into the landscape, and still worked to raise awareness of the danger that threatened Limberlost. The irony of it is Jean made the Limberlost swamp world famous at the very time it was basically destroyed and gone. And her books were read around the world. She sold around 10 million in the 21 years that she was uh, writing books. She was translated to 13 foreign languages in Braille. 
And so she truly has fans from around the world. We've had visitors from Australia. We've had visitors from New Zealand. There are places around the world, like on the island of Tasmania, there's a dairy called the Limberlost Dairy. Anywhere in the world the name Limberlost is, it's because Gene Stratton Porter's works spread it there. Gene Stratton Porter wrote a total of 26 books. At their peak, her novels attracted an estimated 50 million readers worldwide. And these writings would inspire future travelers and communities to continue her legacy and her love for nature and Limberlost Swamp. Every intoxicating delight of early spring was in the air. The breeze that fanned her cheek was laden with subtle perfume and the crisp, fresh odor of unfolding leaves. See the landscapes that inspired Gene Stratton Porter? To learn more or for hours and directions to the Limberlost Historic Site, go to indianamuseum.org. Well, Daryl, you know, I heard that phrase limber lost before, but I really had no idea of the history and that it originated right here in Indiana. I mean, it's amazing her popularity and had such a prolific writer made it all possible. Yeah. Did you have any children's books that were important to you? Yeah, you know, in the same vein, like The Secret Garden, I think was very transporting to me and, you know, I might not have ever made it there, but we can make it to Limber Lost, sort of. Even though Geneva's area of Limberlost did not survive, Jean Stratton Porter did inspire the preservation of other sections of Limberlost wetlands, including the Loblolly Marsh. The marsh that can die and yet return to life in the first breath of spring seems each year to repeat anew to its lovers. Like the cycle of the seasons, the Limberlost Wetlands Preserve has experienced dramatic change over the last century. Once a flourishing 13,000 acre swath of wild wetlands, the area was completely drained by 1912, cultivated into farmlands, and remained as such for over 80 years. But because of the land's natural beauty, and the illustrious writings of the author and naturalist, Jean Stratton Porter, the allure of these marshlands were too much to live without for many. One such local was Ken Brunswick, who started pushing for the portions of land that flooded annually to return to their natural state. By 1993, he had established the Limberlost Swamp Remembered an organization dedicated to restoring the wetlands. And through the help of groups like Friends of the Limberlost, they began buying back parcels of land. As of 2012, over 1,800 acres have been restored, including the 428-acre Heart of Limberlost, known as Loblolly Marsh. With the return of the wetlands came the return of its native inhabitants. And once more, the area was filled with the music of nature. For not only do these wetlands tout an impressive number of vocal frog species, but the surrounding town of Geneva became a designated bird town for having over 200 species of birds identified in the area. And with many of these avian species being migratory shorebirds and waterfowl, the music and liveliness of the wildlife is sure to purvey year-round throughout Limberlost. Today, visitors traversing the wetlands can not only watch, but also listen as they tour the triumphant return of this majestic natural wonder and see firsthand the importance of preserving the beauty and music of the wild. To visit the Limberlost area, including the Loblolly Marsh, or to find other beautiful natural Indiana wonders in your area, visit in.gov slash dnr. Have you ever had that experience when you're reading, you get transported someplace because the imagery is so vivid? Oh yeah. And then you see the inspiration in, in this video piece. Yeah, definitely a must visit place, especially if you're a big fan of jeans. Well, once an open mic house cover band, our next musical guests have grown into a dynamic, diverse ensemble. Meet Audiodacity.
when did we all start playing music together? Kind of started off with like Guitar Hero and just jamming in the dorms. But then towards our senior year, we really got together when one of Ben's parents' friends had a 40th birthday party and we learned some music for that and we just kind of kept making music. We pretty much started as a cover band for our first year before we started writing original music. We joined the Battle of Birdies our second year as a band and to compete in that you have to perform original music. And so that was the catalyst, like, all right, we don't have a choice. We can either show up and suck or we can write original music. We just kind of sat down one day, brought over a couple cases of beer. I'm like, all right, we have to write songs now. Once we got a process down and started combining our musical influences, it just kind of took off from there. We've been described as a genre bedding powerhouse. We make bangers. Instead of making songs that are specific styles, we've learned to blend it all together. It just kind of happens organically. We all have different styles of music that we listen to that we're inspired by. We just try to bring everything to the table and see what happens. We have a rule, never say no. So if we're fleshing out a song and someone has an idea, we always have to listen in context and see, does this work, is this a good idea, and just keep the channels of communication and ideas flowing. It's not easy being in a band. There's a lot of personalities, there's a lot of ideas, there's a lot of perspectives. It helps that we were all friends before we were in a band together. So at the heart of everything we do, long after we're not a band anymore, and long before we were ever a band, we've been friends. I think what it really shows is on-stage performances, because, I mean, we're just having fun. Whether or not we're playing here, jamming and vibing with each other, or on stage in front of hundreds of people, I think that's where it really shows. We want to give them an experience. We want them to come in, enjoy us for a couple hours, you know, all the stress that's going on in their day-to-day -day lives or at work, they can just forget about and just have a good time with friends. And we hope that when they leave our shows that they're in a better place than when they came. The biggest thing I learned about the music industry is that the music business is a relationship business. To be successful in a band, you have to support your venues, you have to support other bands that you're seeing. It's not a competition, it's a community. You get what you put in. If you want to play festivals, you should be going to festivals. If you want to be playing venues, you should go to those venues and support what they do and be there for everyone else that's trying to do the same thing and get that love back. We recently won Nouveau's best overall local group, voted on by Nouveau readers. It really means a lot to us. It lets us know that all the hard work and dedication and sacrifice that we put into being a band is, is worth it. And it lets us know that our sound, our performances, it's working. You know, we're getting our messages across and people legitimately enjoy our music. It's motivation to keep doing it, keep writing more music and stay the course. We start off as a cover band, we join Battle of Birdies, we get introduced to the local scene, we see other people that are doing what they love and what we want to do, then we start writing more, then you see more bands, and you see bigger shows and bigger venues. I think it's just the natural progression of being in a band, but also a fear of complacency. I never want to like look back when I'm 50 and go like, well, these are my 20s, and what could have happened, or what could, I don't want any what ifs. Being able to have a vehicle of self-expression to be able to create, to write songs, and doing it with your best friends. That, at the end of the day, is really what it's about. And now, Audiodacity.
To learn more about this incredible ensemble, hear the latest musical releases, or find out how to visit them live, see their website, audiodacitymusic.com. And as always, you can find other wonderful destination ideas at our website, weeklyspecial.org, and click on the Explore map to find great locations in your own backyard. Well, that's all the time we have for tonight. We hope you enjoyed hearing the stories behind these inspiring Hoosiers. One more time before we go, Audiodacity. Good night.
support for the weekly special is provided by IU School of Public Health Bloomington, addressing public health needs by preventing disease, promoting health, and improving quality of life across the state and around the world through research, teaching, and community engagement. Smithville Fiber, the Giga City Company, Fiber Internet, HD, and Digital IPTV in Southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. The Alcobine Recognition Endowment Fund, established by friends and family of Alcobine to support jazz initiatives on WTIU and WFIU. And WTIU members, thank you 